Hello, and welcome to another Campfire Ghost Stories, presented to you by the Malden Public Library. Tonight's reading is by an author you may have heard a lot about recently. Carmen Maria Machado is the author of the best-selling memoir, In the Dream House, and the award-winning short story collection, Her Body and Other Parties. She has been a finalist for the National Book Award, the winner of the Bard Fiction Prize, the Lambda Literary Award for Lesbian Fiction, the Lambda Literary Award for LGBTQ Nonfiction, the Brooklyn Public Library Literature Prize, the Shirley Jackson Award, and the National Book Critics Circle's John Leonard Prize. In 2018, the New York Times listed Her Body and Other Parties as a member of The New Vanguard, one of 15 remarkable books by women that are shaping the way we read and write fiction in the 21st century. Tonight, I'm going to read to you her short story, Horror Story, which can be found in Granta Magazine. I'll include the link in the comments in case you want to take a closer look. The story itself examines how external and unprecedented experiences can leave her open the fissures in a relationship and leave it damaged and vulnerable. Honestly, I think many of us can relate to that now that we're one year into the pandemic. Okay, with that cheery notion, let's begin. The Horror Story by Carmen Maria Machado. It started so small, a mysteriously clogged drain, a crack in the bedroom window, we just moved into the place, but the drain had been working and the glass had been intact. And then one morning, they weren't. My wife tapped her fingernail lightly on the crack in the pane, and it sounded like something was knocking, asking to be let in. Then the spices went missing. The sea salt, the marjoram, the rosemary, even our custom poultry blend. Finally, the saffron, $40 worth. And I asked my wife if she'd been reorganizing the kitchen. She said she hadn't. A few days later, I found the soft red thread sprinkled in each cup of my bra. I'd have gone to her and produced it as evidence, though evidence of what, I was not certain. But she'd been out of town the night I'd sh shrugged the bra onto the floor before bed and was still gone when I picked it up the next day. I tried to gather the saffron, but it dissolved to dust beneath my fingers, coloring the tips a burnt orange that didn't wash off for days. We blamed the neighbors. We blamed the cat. We blamed each other, especially when I was in the bathroom and she was in the bedroom, and I heard her say, love. Did you hear that sound in the basement? Can you investigate? And she heard me say, Darling, did you hear that sound in the attic? Would you go see what it is? Luckily, we crossed paths when we did in the hallway, in between. Otherwise, who knows what would have been waiting for us in those cramped orifices of the house. But that only occurred to me later. At the time, we accused and accused, then agreed not to talk about it anymore. The strangeness fed our discontent. We'd already been aloof, tender, and now we were fluttering around in our own rafters, sensitive as infants. We'd been discussing counseling even before the clogged drain and the crack in the window. But who can take the time to see a counselor when your wife won't tell you why she's crying? and an invisible presence is tapping icy splinters of Morse code onto the palm of your left hand, as it did to mine the evening the power went out. After that, something moved around at night. It sounded like the cat, until the cat disappeared. Then the padding continued, looping our bed like a satellite, soft pawed, but no longer comforting. We lay in the dark asking each other questions. Do you remember when we met? 
Do you remember when you spilled that bottle of champagne all over the hotel bed in Reno? Do you remember that old woman we saw at the grocery store, the one carrying the baby doll? Do you remember when your cousin fell down the stairs at our 15th wedding anniversary? Do you remember that time I was trying to gently nibble your finger and I bit down so hard by accident? Whatever walked around us gurgled like a pot at low boil whenever we fell silent. So we talked until we were too tired to care. We went to sleep in pajamas and woke to find them neatly stacked at the foot of the bed. One morning, my wife had a blue ribbon tied around her ankle to which was knotted a tiny silver bell. My hairbrush vanished and showed up in the toilet bowl. My wife's daily vitamins were replaced with eight penny nails. On Tuesday, the full length mirror only showed us our reflections as we were when we were girls. Her gawky, me fat, both awkward and years away from the revelation that led us to one another, to this house. I broke the mirror, not by accident. We did research at the library, at City Hall, at the local historical society. It turned out there had been a graveyard for criminals on the property where our home now stood. Also, a woman had been strangled by her lover in our bedroom just after the house was built. Also, a man had hanged himself in the attic during the Great Depression. Also, a teenage girl had been kidnapped and held in the basement for a year in the 70s before the kidnapper, who had never bothered offering a ransom, sent pieces of her body to her family and sets of Russian nesting dolls and then burned what remained of her on the front lawn. We tracked down the tenants who lived there immediately before us. Their eight-year-old son claimed the seam between the world of the living and the dead ran through the foyer. We called a priest who prayed in every room and tossed holy water at the wallpaper but eyed us suspiciously from each doorway until he finally asked if we were sisters. He call, we called a psychic who moved around the house like she was bored until she opened the lid to the dryer, which caused her to snap into the air like she was hanging from an invisible crucifix and recite something in a language we didn't recognize, but which sounded unfathomably ancient. We set a Ouija board on the kitchen table but before we could ask anything, the planchet shot through the air and buried itself in the drywall next to our heads. Last, we called a woman we heard about through word of mouth, who only went by the name Miss. Others swore up and down that she specialized in succeeding where others had failed. But she failed too, and when she left, she recommended we burn all of our possessions and move out. Stories like this don't have happy endings, she said, picking glass fragments out of her hair and waving smoking sage around her body as she departed. My wife and I had a fight about that too. She wanted to leave. I didn't. I can't handle this, she said. I just want to live my life. She blew her nose into a coffee filter because every tissue in the house had turned to ash. But our life is here now, I said. Also, we can't afford to break the lease. That was our biggest indignity. The landlord had rented us a haunted house for above market rent, and we didn't have the money to move. We left him a few voicemails about the matter, but aside from sending a handyman who dredged up clumps of blonde hair and a sparrow bone branded with an unreadable symbol from the depths of the drain, he didn't seem particularly concerned with our plight. That final afternoon, I opened the bedroom door, and instead of seeing our bedroom, where my wife had been resting with the curtains drawn, I was looking into the boudoir of a young woman from a long ago century. She was sitting nude before a mirror, pinning up her hair, and did not seem to notice me. In the bed, beneath a gauzy canopy, a body was moving like it had just emerged from a long, languorous dream. A foot poked out from beneath the blanket, and the sole was gray with dirt. For the first time in months, it was not the interior that felt full of threat. How long had it been since windows had kept 
the many dangers of the world away, rather than held them in. But this room was safe, all swaddling and perfume and late summer, early morning quiet. The young woman smoothed her hands over her hair, tilted her chin upward, and tugged on her lip before letting it moistly snap back over her teeth. Then she crawled into the bed where her lover, another young woman with ruddy skin and a smile that carved trenches into her cheeks, sat up and stroked her face. They pulled close and I heard them laugh and their kiss was wet and tangible like an oyster passed between them. I felt a tingle of tears. I slammed the door shut. When I opened it again, my wife was standing there looking just woke and mournful. After that, we were alone together. So that was a fairly quick one this week. I want to thank you for listening and for supporting the library. We're fortunate to be able to bring you this and other programming while we continue modified services and curbside pickup. This year has been confusing and frightening and sometimes heartbreaking. But it has also been a pleasure to be able to support our community, even from afar. It has been a privilege to be a part of a city that values the health and safety of its citizens, while also being dedicated to offering services, information, and support for more than just basic needs. The people of Malden have shown what a community ought to do in the face of unprecedented challenges. We have been stronger more resilient and safer by working together in the service of others. So thank you again for listening. We hope to be back next week with another Campfire Ghost Story. Thank <laughs> you.